on World News Tonight. Calls for arrest. Clashes have taken over the streets of Pakistan between the state police and Imran Khan supporters. Rising tensions. A Russian jet downs an American drone over the Black Sea. Will the US retaliate? Find out tonight. More layoffs. Tech supergiant Meta lays off more than 10,000 employees in a quote, humbling move. Pakadam fantasy. Thailand treats their elephants with food and cleanups on Elephant Day. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and you're joining us on World News. On our top story tonight, the deadlock between former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan supporters and law enforcement officers. Pakistani police and supporters of Khan fought pitched battles outside his home in Lahore, winning several on both sides ahead of his expected arrest. Police hit Khan supporters in baton charges and lobbed tear gas canisters, some of which landed on the lawns of Khan's house. A helicopter was hovering over his house with the internet connection being cut off in that area. Interior Minister Rana Saullah said at a public rally telecast that they will arrest Imran Khan and present him in court. Today, former Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan said in a video address that he is willing to give a surety bond that he will appear in court on March 18th as clashes continued between his supporters and law enforcers. A total trial court in the capital Islamabad had issued the arrest warrant for Khan for unlawfully selling state gifts while in power from 2018 to 2022. Khan's aide Shah Mahmood Karisi said the former prime minister had secured protective bail from a court. Khan has been demanding a snap election in protest rallies across the country since his ouster from office in a parliamentary vote earlier last year. That demand was rejected by his successor Sheba Sharif, who has said the vote would be held as scheduled later this year. Khan was shot and wounded in one of these rallies and Khan also called on his supporters to stand up for the supremacy of the law. In an update on the AUKUS pact made yesterday, China warned that Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States were threading a part of error and danger after they unveiled a nuclear-powered submarine steel. Russia too has expressed their dissatisfaction with the new alliance. It's a deal aimed squarely at China's growing influence in the Indo-Pacific. Australia teaming up with the U.S. and Britain to acquire nuclear-powered submarines. Five to be delivered in the next decade, followed by a new class of submarines with British designs and American technology. On Tuesday, China's foreign ministry accused the three Western allies of inciting a new arms race. The latest joint statement from the US, UK and Australia demonstrates that the three countries, for the sake of their own geopolitical interests, completely disregard the concerns of the international communities and are walking further and further down the path of error and danger. On Monday, US President Joe Biden appeared alongside the Prime Ministers of Australia and Britain at a naval base in San Diego, where they hailed the so-called AUKUS Partnership, an acronym of the three countries. China wasn't alone in its criticism of the pact. Moscow also lashed back. The Anglo-Saxon world, with the creation of structures like AUKUS and with the advancement of NATO military infrastructures into Asia, is making a serious bet on many years of confrontation. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has said he didn't expect the deal would sour his country's relationship with China, while Australia's defense minister said AUKUS was necessary to counter the biggest conventional military buildup in the region since World War II. A Taiwanese state-owned military weapons developer unveiled five new types of indigenous military drones as the self-ruled island looks to boost its asymmetric warfare capabilities against China's growing military threat. These are Taiwan's new high-tech military drones. Learning from the current war in Ukraine, Taiwan has felt a renewed sense of urgency to bolster its defences. The country says the drones are key to improving its asymmetric warfare capacity where the resources between those involved in a conflict are uneven. They hope the technology will enhance the agility of its forces, should they ever have to face China's far larger military. China, which has never renounced the use of force to bring Taiwan under its control, has ramped up military activity near the democratically governed island in an effort to force it to accept Chinese sovereignty. Taiwan's armed forces are well-equipped, but are still dwarfed by China's. 
The latest models of the domestically produced drones were displayed at the military-owned National Chungshan Institute of Science and Technology. His Chi Li Pin, director of Aeronautical Systems Research Division for the organization. Bold use is one of the options available to us. That's why the Ministry of Defense has introduced the commercial and military-grade UAVs for military use. I hope our national troops can familiarize themselves with this weapon of asymmetric warfare. Use them boldly. Taiwan's military has announced a partnership with companies aimed at producing 3,000 drones next year. Among the items on display was an attack drone with loitering munitions that can cruise towards a target before plummeting at velocity and detonating on impact, as well as surveillance drones. Taiwan's defence ministry claims China has sent its drones to areas close to the island to test its responses. It added in a report to Parliament this week that China was quickly building up its combat capacity with drones, including swarms of flying robots. China's Taiwan Affairs Office did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Silicon Valley Bank is now under U.S. federal investigation after its collapse. The Department of Justice and the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission have launched probes looking at the company's executive stock sales before the bank closed, among other things. There also have been growing calls for regulation and accountability. The U.S. Department of Justice is investigating the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. That's according to a source familiar with the matter on Tuesday. This comes as scrutiny mounts over its sudden demise and regulators scramble to contain the fallout. The Securities and Exchange Commission has launched an investigation as well, according to the Wall Street Journal, which first reported the probes. The Justice Department, the bank and the SEC declined to comment. The investigation is in its early stages and may not result in allegations of wrongdoing or charges being filed, the source said. The rapid collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and the fall of Signature Bank have left regulators racing to contain risks to the rest of the sector. On Tuesday, ratings agency Moody's cut its outlook on the U.S. banking system to negative from stable. Despite that, bank stocks climbed across the board on Tuesday. First Republic jumped 25 percent in afternoon trading. As investors bet the crisis was ebbing, after President Joe Biden this week said all depositors in the failed banks would be protected and vowed to strengthen the banking system. During the Obama-Biden administration, we put in place tough requirements on banks like Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, including the Dodd-Frank law to make sure that the crisis we saw in 2008 would not happen again. Unfortunately, the last administration rolled back some of these requirements. I'm going to ask Congress and the banking regulators to strengthen the rules for banks to make it less likely this kind of bank failure would happen again and to protect American jobs and small businesses. The Federal Reserve is also conducting a review of these recent bank failures. Democratic U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren wants Fed Chair Jerome Powell to stay out of this, accusing him of contributing to the failures by supporting the easing of bank rules. In a statement Tuesday, Warren wrote, For the Fed's inquiry to have credibility, Powell must publicly and immediately recuse himself from this internal review. Separately, Senator Warren sent a letter to the former CEO of Silicon Valley Bank, Greg Becker, pressing for details on the bank's lobbying in favor of a 2018 law that eased regulations for large regional banks, which she and others have pointed to as contributing to the bank's Friday collapse. She also asked for information regarding any stock sales by executives or bonuses paid out in the months leading up to its failure. A Russian fighter jet forced down a U.S. Air Force drone over the Black Sea after damaging the propeller of the American MQ-9 Reaper drone. Russia denied one of its jets collided with the U.S. drone over the Black Sea. The Russian military of defense said that Russia has detected the U.S. drone flying over the Black Sea near the Crimea Peninsula in the direction of the state border of the Russian Federation and scrambled jets to identify the intruder. A high-altitude, high-risk intercept. The U.S. says it lost an MQ-9 drone on Tuesday when the craft's propeller was clipped by a Russian Su-27 fighter jet, causing the unmanned aircraft to crash into the Black Sea. The Pentagon says a pair of Su-27s had been harassing the U.S. drone in international airspace, dumping fuel on it and flying dangerously close. U.S. officials have called the collision a brazen violation of international law. 
This incident demonstrates a lack of competence in addition to being unsafe and unprofessional. U.S. and allied aircraft will continue to operate in international airspace and we call on the Russians to con conduct themselves professionally and safely. In a statement posted to Telegram, Russia denied its jet collided with the drone, instead claiming the MQ-9 lost control after a sharp maneuver. Moscow has previously expressed its displeasure with U.S. surveillance flights near the Crimean Peninsula, which Russia illegally annexed from Ukraine in 2014. U.S. and NATO officials say Russian intercepts over the Black Sea are common, citing a pattern of aggressive and dangerous actions by Russian pilots. Russia's invasion and NATO's assistance to Ukraine have raised fears of a direct confrontation between nuclear-armed states. Military analysts and NATO diplomats, though, say they don't expect Tuesday's incident to escalate. We're going in for a short commercial break. We'll be back with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. North Korea fired at least two ballistic missiles towards the EC, their second test in just two days. This as Pyongyang continues its backlash against the ongoing joint military exercises by Seoul and Washington. North Korea fires more missiles just two days after its previous provocation. South Korea's military from 7.41 a.m. to 7.51 a.m. Tuesday local time detected two short-range ballistic missiles fired off to the east. They were fired from Hwanginamdo province on the peninsula's west coast and flew for 620 kilometers before landing in the East Sea. That's a distance that puts the south of the Korean peninsula well within range. Seoul and Washington's intelligence authorities are currently analyzing the details of the launch. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said in a statement that North Korea's consecutive missile launches are serious acts of provocation and a clear violation of UN Security Council resolutions. It is demanding an immediate stop to these actions. It also said that it has strengthened monitoring and vigilance for any possible extra launches and that it's working closely with its U.S. ally to maintain full readiness. In fact, state-of-the-art American spy planes patrolled over the Korean peninsula this morning around the time of North Korea's missile firing. The RC-135S Cobra Ball was deployed over the East Sea and the RC-135U combat scent was dispatched to the west. These aircraft most likely gauged the projectile's trajectory and the point of impact. This is North Korea's fifth ballistic missile firing this year. It also closely follows North Korea's two summary launched missiles on Sunday, of which the North claims to be strategic cruise missiles, which hints that these weapons could be nuclear capable. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said to reporters on Monday that the U.S. is analyzing these summary launch tests to gauge the North's full weapons power. Pyongyang has been stepping up its weapons tests and fiery tone as a clear protest against this whole Washington military exercises. The Freedom Shield, the largest joint drill between the Allies in five years, kicked off Monday. It lasts for 11 days total and runs through some realistic war scenarios on computer-based simulations and extensive field training that factors in the up-to-date progress of North Korea's weapons capabilities. To the training, the U.S. is also expected to deploy its strategic assets, some of its most formidable weapons that could include nuclear-powered aircraft. There was a much-anticipated announcement for the South Koreans as they will be allowed to go mask-free on buses and subways starting next week. This means the mask mandate has been lifted almost everywhere and all the pandemic restrictions are scrapped except for the mandatory isolation for those infected. From next week, people in South Korea will no longer be required to wear a mask when using public transport. The mask mandate on public transport has been in place for about two years and five months. It is one of the last remaining indoor mask mandates after the South Korean government lifted the mandate for most indoor places at the end of January, except for a few places such as hospitals, care facilities and pharmacies. Speaking of pharmacies, the government has also decided to lift the mask rules for pharmacies that are inside supermarkets or stations. Back in January, when the government lifted the indoor mask mandate, 
people still had to put one back on when using pharmacies in those places, which experts saw as ineffective. Although the mask mandate will be lifted for public transport and for specific pharmacies from next Monday, the government still suggests senior citizens or those with pre-existing conditions keep wearing masks. People who use public transport during rush hour are also recommended to wear a mask, as well as those with COVID-19 symptoms. South Korea is likely to completely lift the mask mandate in all places and adjust the self-isolation period from the current seven days only after the World Health Organization lifts a global emergency declaration at the end of April or early May. Emergency crews in California renewed stand bagging operations and round-the-clock patrols of leaves and rain-swollen riverbanks as the state braced for the season's 11th atmospheric river, an airborne current laden with dense tropical moisture from the ocean. Entire neighborhoods inundated by muddy brown waters. Streets once bustling, now eerily quiet. This is Monterey County, California, after a levee on the Pajaro River failed late on Friday night flooding the area and forcing emergency evacuations into the morning. By Monday, the evacuation warnings and orders were still in place for the county and other areas of California, as the state now prepares to face its 11th so-called atmospheric river of the season. Some residents, however, have decided to stay put. Among them were seasonal farm workers Maria Martinez and Frida Gonzalez. Martinez says she does not want to leave because homes have been robbed in the area and there's been vandalism. She wants the government to provide security, clean water and food for her children. I think I got visual on them. Staying put poses its own risks, though. On Sunday, a man was rescued from an island in the Salinas River after his car was swept away in flood water. It is on. Dramatic footage released by the California Highway Patrol shows the victim being hoisted on a rope dangling from a helicopter. Since December, California has been hit by 10 atmospheric rivers. They are categorized as airborne currents laden with dense tropical moisture from the ocean. Meanwhile, most of New York State and New England were preparing on Monday for a powerful nor'easter storm. Facebook owner Meta announced a fresh wave of job cuts, part of what CEO Mark Zuckerberg called the company's year of efficiency as the U.S. tech sector continues to downsize. Meta Platforms announced Tuesday that it will axe 10,000 more jobs, its second round of mass layoffs, as the tech industry braces for a deep economic downturn. The job cuts, which come after the company slashed 11,000 jobs in November, are part of a larger restructuring plan, as CEO Mark Zuckerberg declared last month that 2023 would be Meta's, quote, year of efficiency. The owner of Facebook and Instagram, which had been pouring billions of dollars into building the futuristic metaverse, has struggled with a slump in advertising. And Daniel Ives, senior equity analyst at Wedbush Securities, said Meta may be changing course. In a message to staff, Zuckerberg called 2022, quote, a humbling wake-up call and said while the latest job cuts would be announced in April and May, they could continue through the end of the year. Worries of an economic downturn due to rising interest rates have sparked a series of mass job cuts across corporate America from Wall Street banks, such as Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, to fellow big tech firms Amazon and Microsoft. Meta shares jumped 6% Tuesday on the news. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The world's second largest metals and mining company, Rio Tinto, launched the underground phase of the Oyutorgoi copper mine in Mongolia's Gobi Desert, one of the world's largest copper and gold deposits. Taiwan's foreign ministry urged Honduras to carefully consider its decision to build ties with China and not fall into China's trap. Honduran president said that she had asked the country's foreign ministry to start official relations with China, pressuring Taiwan ahead of a sensitive visit by President Tsai Ing-wen to the United States and Central America. 
A SpaceX Dragon 2 capsule carrying supplies for the International Space Station launched from Cape Canaveral. A live NASA webcast showed the spacecraft ascending from the launch tower as its Merlin engines roared to life in the billowing clouds of vapor and a reddish fireball that lit up the entire night sky. Streets turned into rivers in San Pedro, the Atacama city, as heavy rains hit northeastern Chile. Heavy rains and flash floods caused power outages and damaged five homes. Search teams in Gabon have recovered the dead bodies of 15 passengers of a ferry that sank off the West African country's coast last week, bringing the provisional death toll up to 21. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of our stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we finish off tonight's rendition of World News in our northern eastern neighbour, Thailand, where 60 elephants enjoyed a feast of fruits and vegetables at the Baltic Park in Chambury to celebrate National Elephants Day. Thank you and good night.